Welcome to the Human Design Collective Podcast, where we explore this system as a unique map of our potential, from the mundane to the mystical. If you're looking to dive deeper into human design, join our Living Your Design Workshop. You can start the course at any time and participate in live meetings with John Cole and Amy Lee. Rave ABCs is the next step in the foundation courses, through which we begin to see into the mechanics of our nature. We invite you to join us for our next live nine-week class starting April 14, 2021. For more information on these foundation courses and other transformational workshops, go to courses.humandesigncollective.com. Today we're speaking with Therese Jaegersberger, who's been exploring and working with human design for over 16 years. From her stories of early days learning about design on Ibiza, to her discoveries as a self-projected projector, she brings a clear and gentle wisdom with a frequency that is truly her own. We hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you for joining us today, Therese. This is a treat for us as we were just talking about having another projector on the podcast. We haven't had a lot of projectors so far, and I thought that we could just get together today and see what comes up, what we're all looking at, you know, where our awareness flows. To start, we'd like to hear a little bit about how you came into human design and when it entered your life and what that was like for you. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me again. Like I said before, it's really very special for me too to be here. I'm very happy about that. Yeah, well, um, I came to human design 16 and a half years ago. Um, this was in May. Well, what was that? Which year? 2004? That was the year. And I had moved to Ibiza in 1998. A year after my son was born. He's 23, 24 this year. Uh, was my ex-husband who invited me. And it was before human design that I got the invitation to go to Ibiza. Um, this, he knew the island. I didn't. I lived in, in Austria. I grew up here. And then there was his dream to go to Ibiza. And first it was like, okay, the party island, <laughs> like other people might think. But upon visiting, I immediately fell in love with it. And we were building a house and it was still another, yeah, five years before I met human design, basically, when we moved in. And life had been a bit tough before, well, rather tough, I would say. <laughs> I don't want to play it down as a projector mother with no motor, a mother of a manifesting, emotional manifesting generator child. And we were divorcing after a few years, and I was mostly on my own. And then I had a new partner. A year after the divorce and he was he's German and he was friends with Ra. He was 20 years older than me and he was about Ra, Ra's age about and one day he was like you know um, human design uh, there could be something for you there are people around here they could give you a reading and so I was basically also invited to that. It was Christoph Rabanus one of uh, Ra's first pupils and analysts and the first thing he told me, like about not being here to work, about being so open, having no motor, it made total sense. And I knew that there was a big change in my life just to know this. And as a typical projector, I wanted to know immediately about my son and other people. And he was like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> but then we figured that out too, because it was really important. So we had an additional reading and um, that was such a relief. And from then on, I was really lucky because my son gate, uh, the gate of my personality son is um, 46, 5, as serendipity. So it really has felt to be in the right place at the right time. Soon afterwards, I was invited to Ra's house because Christoph was friends and it was still those days where things were smaller and people went to each other's houses. And yeah, I had some um, birthday lunch there with Ra. It was a Ra's birthday or, or one of his children. There's a birthday cake in one of the big pictures. So I don't remember. It was clear to for me immediately that I want to, to go on. And um, the first little analyst training group emerged under a olive tree next to the seaside. And so I, I started and never stopped really getting deeper and deeper as a 5-1, of course, my first line wants to dig deep. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got started. So that was, you said, 16 and a half years ago? 
Yes. Wow. In 2004, in May, yeah. On 24th of May, I had my first reading. And yeah, it's a long time. That's a long time. <laughs> it's like, hmm. <laughs> and how has it changed over the years? Like over that time period of 16 years, your either relationship with the knowledge, you know, living as a projector, you'd said it just mm. kept deepening and going deeper into it. And what was that process like for you? Well, in the beginning, typical projector, I wanted to know it all. <laughs> I think I had five one on top of it. Mm-hmm. And I, after a few months, I thought I knew so much. And I started giving readings, which was just part of my human design education as an analyst. So like not pretending I'm an analyst, just saying I'm a student. And I was telling everybody everything as Whoever could get hold of later on, I was apologizing <laughs> and saying, now you get a reading for free. I mean, it didn't pay me. Maybe they paid me a coffee or a meal in the beginning. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what did I do? So um, with deep, the more I learned, uh, the more I experienced, the more I could also let go of thinking I knew everything <laughs> and being so mental. As I have a split between my two definitions, my mental definition, the abstract channel um, of 64 and uh, 47, trying to make sense of everything all the time. And at the same time, I have my big G connection to the throat with two parallel channels, the alpha and the role model, the A1 and the 31.7. Took time, but with time, I could tell the difference if I was speaking from my mind which can be okay if it's invited, if it's only some sense making and, and all that. But when I speak from my G, it's a different thing. And that got more and more important also for people to resonate with me. And I, in the beginning, the first years, even I heard like, oh, yeah, you're so, so I don't know, a stressful, stubborn, <laughs> you think you know everything better. And it took me a while to really well not identify so much also with only that um, part of my my definition get more into my g Mm. and let my myself guide from there and be of value to others which i think is is more um they need from me Mm -hmm. my motivation is also need so i figured that out when i started studying uh race psychology but a year or so, I don't know when I got invited by Ra, actually. The first year I had for free because I was also contributing on the radio. Mel Britain had the human design radio then. He was hosting it. It was great. People just for free had the insights, the, the contributions. I don't know if you guys listen to human design radio ever. I haven't heard it yet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This one is... Yeah, from the dinosaur age, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, this was in the, the, in the early 2000s. And I don't know when it stopped. It was before I died. I can't remember when they gave it up. Um, then I said something about the G projectors there on, on the radio um, about when I was a child that I talked to my adult self and it must have been from my G because I imagined my adult self on a staircase upper, uh, higher than I was with my seven years old or so. And I implored my adult self saying, you do not forget what it is like to be me, <laughs> to be a child. Don't be like the other adults ever. So I was like really trying to protect me from homogenization or something. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I talked about that and then Rogers wrote me an email saying, you're invited uh, for the next human design event and if you want to, you can study race psychology or something. But it was also, I have to admit, because he knew my then partner and he knew I wanted to be involved in something. It was also a job thing. And, uh, the Jovian, um, what is it called? Customer support. Yeah, so that's how I got like really involved and met all these people at human design events uh, who were coming every once a year. They came from um, Genoa, Bliven, and um, uh, uh, lots of people. They were just, some don't even live anymore from England, America, 
and Richard Beaumont and also, of course, uh, Austrians, Andrea Reichelwolf. Um, yeah, but I don't know, Ilse Sendler it was still the Austrian division, Peter Schöber also gave me another reading then. And I was just really lucky to be always where the human design people were. Mm -hmm. And people on the island were pretty poor. So those who dwelled there also like staying the winter where they couldn't do much business. So my readings were not giving me much of an income, but I learned so much. I learned so much about people. We had our little study groups. We went to cafes, also the study around with Mel and other people. Even in winter, there was fireplaces in the village of Santa Gertrudis or Santa Lalia. We just talked human design all day, more or less. It was normal for me. And I thought, that's life now. And it will be always like that. It will never change. <laughs> it sounds kind of like a dream to me, what you're describing. I mean, maybe looking back in the past, it is like it, it is a bit of a dream but yeah just to have that small local community environment the coziness or just going into people's yeah. houses and hanging around talking about human design all day on an island like wow yeah could cause them <laughs> yeah very different than 500 facebook groups with thousands of people all over the world <laughs> <laughs> i'm curious about yeah. since you were introduced to it in some of the early days of when the training was becoming formalized, how was authority described to you as a self-projected projector? Was it already clearly formed at that point? And how was it described to you? And did you relate to it the way it was described to you? Hmm. Well, yeah, 16 years ago, as far as I remember, it was pretty clear already that the G was called G authority. Self-project, I only heard later, but the G as an authority. Uh, my analyst, uh, Christoph, is a splenic projector. So he could relate a lot, uh, talking of his own experience also as a projector, but his G is undefined. So from, it was more um, what he knew about it. Mm -hmm. And it made sense. <laughs> like my mind, yeah, it made sense. Um, and then I remember that whenever I apparently was recognized in my life before, I couldn't have got a grip on it, what it was, what the difference was, that uh, there was something like almost touchable in the air, like something coming from my G or resonating with my G. Maybe it's, it's, it's this sound thing also that my PHS is high frequency lighting up a lamp or a light in my G. So something happened almost physically whenever people recognized me. And when somebody came into the room, I remember my student day days in Vienna who didn't recognize me or was even like projecting something negative on me. This whole thing shrank again and um, it expanded when there was somebody who, even without talking, I knew would see me for who I was, which is difficult with a 5-1, but within those possibilities. And then my G would like really uh, feel, it would expand, but also like a light. So when Christoph said that this is my inner authority and it's about uh, the higher self and magnetism, yeah, I don't, I don't remember the words exactly what he said, but this was, yeah, yeah, that's here in my sternum. That's me. That's, that's what's happened then apparently with, with the right people in the right context. And also on my own, when I can feel the pull when even, it's just for myself, when it doesn't involve people, how it can pull me towards places or mm -hmm. towards something that makes me happy. It's mm -hmm. also very strong. Yeah, yeah. so this made sense or could could really resonate that I'm a G projector. So like a magnetism and a resonance. I have a lot mm. of G projectors in my life as close friends. And there does seem okay. to be something about it that I sense that feels like this very natural connection to happiness, to a certain kind of yes. Yes. resonance with their own sense of what lights them up and makes them feel happy that it feels very different to me than when I sense a sacral center lighting up or a spleen lighting up. It, ha it has a different quality mm -hmm. to me, but it does feel like a kind of resonance and a kind of light and something that's connected to happiness, which 
I always found so fascinating about G projectors to have that as an authority just seems very, very particular in that way. Yeah, this I heard later about the happiness only this, um, but it also was totally clear that mm -hmm. is the thing. And I thought always everybody, it's, it's the same for everybody. So before human design, you think um, that must be the same for everyone. <laughs> happiness is the thing <laughs> to be <laughs> People are like, no, there's so many different things that are important or whatever. But I also got uh, quite a bunch of G projectors in my life connected. And that's nice. Yeah, because we are few in total percentage. And still, like, um, we attract each other also. It's a bit that we are the hummingbirds also of the planet, like Ra called us hummingbirds by this magnetism humming along somewhere <laughs> happily, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. And even in that, there's a lightness to it. Mm. It's, yeah. it's not like a freight train or, no, you know, no, 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 no. <laughs> or a cougar <laughs> or something. No. <laughs> it's a hummingbird. It is. It is. Yeah. No motor is different than motors, even for projectors. We are so many different types, uh, not types, but different variations of, of projectors, mm. especially the energy projectors. But still, a projector is a projector. Aura does all the talking. You mentioned this word pull earlier in relationship to your authority. And I wanted to ask about that and the magnetic nature of the mm. G-Center. My definition is the 2551, which is basically the ego authority. I also experienced that as a type of pull. And I think it's the connection to the G. It's, it's not just about my will, but it's also about, in a sense, what I love, what I want, and what I'm pulled towards. And a lot of that process feels like, who was it who called it decision watching? Was that Dirk? I think he said, yeah, it's not decision making, it's decision watching. And that really resonated mm -hmm. with me. It's like watching my body or my will or what I love pull me in a certain direction. Do you experience like that pull in that way? Or how is that for you? Yes, absolutely. Somehow when it can almost, I don't know how you can say that about well, English is not my first language. Also, sometimes I'm, I'm short of words. Um, it's, a, it's a whole being, um, but of course it's, it's felt in, in my sternum pull. Like I have this for places. It must have been now 11, 12 years ago. I suddenly knew and had this pull that I have to go to Hawaii or Kauai actually. Mm. <laughs> Something I picked it up. Uh, I had been already in contact with uh, John Martin. Then uh, there was customer support for Jovian. And it was in the days 15 years ago. So when he wasn't really recognized in the beginning because he didn't have a formal education. And then later and I was asking and then me and they were a bit like, nah, nah, nah. They, in, in course of time, they realized how important he was for the HD community and how many people he really got into human design and I knew I had to go there. A landscape, something I knew. And then the next human design event, which was maybe some month later than 2008, no, it was already 2009, I think. Yeah, there were people from Kauai and of course I connected and I thought, is this now because my mind wants that? But it was really my whole body connecting. And then I got an invitation and a few months later, I was on a plane onto Hawaii. And although it's like the other end of the world and for a motorless being, it could be a real drag. I just flew over there. And I, was, I realized now I landed in Kauai because I had to be here. And that's how it happened. <laughs> so this, if the, because the pull was so strong, I don't know how this worked out. Well, there was some mental decision involved too, which is still happened or sometimes happens and if it does then I'm like okay you know that your mind was involved now do you really want to watch what happens now or is it something you don't have to do anymore I was like let's see let's see there's also this kind of curiosity let's see what happens and the mental part was that I started a relationship with the guy well of course he invited me but I know it was for the wrong um, well, wrong for the incorrect, but well, there was something incorrect in it. Person with five motors and he, he, he was really afraid train. <laughs> and um, 
I, physically, it was really exhausting for me. And also, I didn't feel really recognized. So this part was not so great. And I was just saying, okay, you knew this would happen. You had to do it again. But the good thing is, Kawai itself, it healed me so much. Mm. This earth there, these volcanic stones, the jungle, the frequency. Yeah, my high frequency was so resonating. And the sea and Kauai is not so populated. There was really pristine nature. And I met other nice people there. So it was really worth it. And yeah. I went there twice. And only the second trip, I met John Martin, uh, the guy who I was with then. And the first time, he didn't allow me to go to see John Martin. <laughs> I had to laugh now. <laughs> I only really found out later there was some jealousy going on with an ex-girlfriend. Ah, the human design community also has all these freakish things. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I was, it was a shorter trip, so I went back. But then I knew I had to come again, which I did a few months later. And then I met John, and that was also really, really important for me. I had to do it. I knew it, and that happened. And this was my G, also pulling me there and make, letting me have that experience. Mm. I was really, really good. Yeah, that was the two times I went to Kauai, just because my G pulled me there. But as other people were involved, I didn't initiate anything. But the invitation was not 100% correct, I would say. And that's why there was also some pain involved. But that was an important learning thing. I love what you're saying about that piece in particular, which I know I've experienced many times in my life. And I, I don't know if it may also be more of a projector thing, or maybe we all go through this or many of us do, but that sense of when you know you're doing something that isn't quite right and you know that you know better, but you also know that you're going to do it anyway. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just kind of watching it. And that's just a fascinating experience to me. At least if we can't stop ourselves from doing what we're going to do, at least we can be aware and watch yeah. and, and then see what we learn from it and know that in the end, maybe it makes that awareness more clear. But yeah. No, I don't regret it at all. Yeah. It's not anything of like, oh, I shouldn't. I, mm -hmm. It's more like, yeah, it was sometimes painful. And there was a lot also of heartbreak involved, but I knew it. And I was going in, walking into it with open eyes, not like with eyes closed and then suddenly waking up. I knew it and I was like, okay, you needed that apparently, but you don't have to repeat it because there would have been a chance to continue the whole experience. And that's when I knew, no, there has to be a stop. Cannot um, drag it out because the experience has been, yeah. For a whole year, I was there twice. A guy came twice, mm. and uh, to Europe, and then we knew. I I knew no more because it's too painful, and I had to end it. Mm -hmm. And it's also a thing for a projector to end something without being uninvited officially. But it might be also the G. I don't know for other projectors. I always hear this: you have to be uninvited, and it's not sustainable anymore for me. I can really walk away. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't mean the person is out of my system. Of course, they will stay in my system for years. This <laughs> is another thing at the cellular level. But at least I do not have to drag out painful experiences forever. Also something, I don't know if it's as, well, easy. I wouldn't call it easy. But for other projectors, I heard they, they wait and wait and wait. Mm -hmm. And stay in a very painful situation for a long time. Do you think it's more common to see that long ending or dragged out situation when there's some level of energetic or material dependency involved for a projector? Like if the projector had, let's just say the resources or the money to go do whatever they want, then it might be a little bit easier just to walk away from something. But I think a lot of projectors are in relationships where they're, if not energetically dependent, they're materially dependent on some level or... There, there are other people involved or you're in the context of a penta or something and it just gets yeah. complicated. Do you think? That yeah, that's no, of course. 
and I don't want to judge anyone and you can never say anything for somebody else in whose shoes you haven't walked and you can walk in people's shoes but you can't have the design and experience <laughs> there you can borrow their shoes and say ah oh, they could be like it <laughs> still too big or too small but yeah of course the material plane for a projector especially also with open or undefined ego would make it very hard so I was also lucky there because even when I got divorced, um, I got financial support. And this also happened to me with the generator who was my ex-husband and the father of my son. When um, we got together, he had already had three divorces before me. <laughs> and he was an actor, an art director. He wrote books. So he was not poor. And uh, there was always a fight for money in the divorces. And with my G. Even before human design, of course, it worked. I just didn't know how, but I did. I said to him, well, if you want, we can write a prenuptial that I don't want any money from you. And a typical open ego, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want any money. Uh, so you do not have, feel threatened. Poor you. Yeah, what the other women did to you. My God, I'm so much better. I don't know what I tried to prove then. No, but it came also from my G. It really came from my G. I didn't want him to have this feeling it goes wrong that he has to pay and there's a fight we will be fair I said and we'll just sort it out and just because I said that and it came really from my heart well the heart part of the G he said and you know what and we also write into that prenuptial that because you give up your job as a teacher I was a teacher then um, that you will um, be supported by me um, until also I was pregnant then already when we married uh, until our son is old enough and, and you'll never have to fear to be poor. So it came from me wanting to give him something from my, my G and this oh. came back to me. And then when it came to the divorce, things got tougher and he, I think he would have wanted to take some of it back, but it just was clear then it was written and so I was supported. And we made friends again on off. It worked in a way that I didn't have to stay or didn't even consider staying for money. I wouldn't have anyways. I had other offers. I had them quite often in my life mm -hmm. to be in a situation with rich people, or rich men, because when I was young, I was a photo model and I played in a film and so on. And so I was um, always getting offers and it was never a temptation for me. I was like, no. And I was very stubborn. <laughs> no, not with me. <laughs> There's also this piece in relation to the G Center that has to do with the spontaneous voice, the way that it's often talked about and written about. Can you share your perspective on that? How you experience voice and also spontaneity, if that's a part of it? <laughs> you mean the verbal gunslinger? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I know a lot about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can really talk people down and uh, talk without stopping. I mean, it can still happen. My poor second husband, who is an, an emotional manifester with ego defined, he has got all the three other motors, not the sacral, of course, but the other motors. So he's somebody grounded and he's on the cross of rulership, a 2-4 uh, manifester. But he has got an open, well, not open, an undefined um, Ajna, head and Ajna, and mine is defined. So this can come from there. That's annoying because mm. all the compromising. But this gunslinger G, uh, when I have to share something, also when I'm really positively excited because there's something new and it makes me happy and I want to be there and he listens. So that's the right person for me. While my ex-husband, oh my God, he couldn't hear, he couldn't, not a minute. He was like, oh, well, I don't want to hear it, just stop it. And with my husband now, he's like really a patient listener and even gives me feedback. And although he's not into human design, he knows about human design and he says, yeah, he can see whatever I say about it, that it is the way it is and he doesn't say it's about right or wrong because that's not one of his ways of seeing things or these things especially it's more like yeah she says i know you need to talk and to listen to yourself so he even says that although it's not into him because he whatever he would say i wouldn't hear it especially not in the beginning 
just has to come out. Yeah, so absolutely, there is no, no choice. But I know the difference now between environments, people who would invite me to do that or where I'm generally basically invited and where I'm not. And there I have to really stop myself. I really learned to shut up. <laughs> so, good projector, but it's still hard often enough. I want to, but I, no, no, you're not saying it. You're not saying it. It's a powerful projector skill. <laughs> The art of shutting up. <laughs> what also helped the general Bliven, who was the former head of a human design in America, like also like, I don't know when, 50 years ago or so, once said to me, you know, projector, he's a manifest. I don't know if you know general. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he's a manifester. And he said, yeah, you know, it's not so bad. Like, projectors always talking and even if they're not invited and this is going on but you can compare it to a mosquito (laughs) (laughs) and that's really annoying and that picture really helped me and I was like one day somebody will just (laughs) smash me squish me against the wall so I better don't but I heard myself then when I could see the reaction by other people who were not happy with what I had to say like, ah, I'm the mosquito now. It's like me. So stop, stop. It's a learning. Mm-hmm. Do you have this also? Is this more a G projector thing? I mean, I guess every projector has this kind of just comes from somewhere else. The voice. Is, mm-hmm. is... Yeah, for me, the voice is a central part of my process. And the gunslinger is a common (laughs) experience for me. So I do have to really watch that I don't get carried away with my own awareness when people are not interested in Mm. it. I wonder if this is part of the individuality, which you may share also, that Mm. when Mm. my awareness gets really locked on something that seems true to me, it's stubborn in a way. It's thick, it's rigid and that can add to the cold, pointy, penetrating, uh, Mm. irritating kind of interface (laughs) if that's not what somebody's asking for. And even when they are asking for it, I'll often find that I would probably feel the urge to go on much longer than someone else Mm. would actually want. Yeah, well, this um, I don't know which line you're 43, 23 has got if it's the one track mind or any other variation yes, it is it is <laughs> how did you know i don't know you I must be no psychic <laughs> yeah. well it's the advantage maybe of the compromise with my little gate 23 which i have there it's can if i surrender to your whole channel i'm like ah what is it what is it is it one track mind yeah, no, it's an interesting how, how you, we experience it ourselves. I still sometimes we are so helpless <laughs> in the whole thing, mm-hmm. even, even knowing that. How long have you guys been in, into human design? I found human design in 2009, and it mm-hmm. was right after my daughter was born. My daughter was a couple months old. Mm. So, That's cool. Yeah, and John Martin her. was my first teacher. So. Oh. That was John Martin was well, John, my first teacher. Really? Yeah. Oh, that so, was, yeah, well, I'm that was my about introduction John. to being a projector. And, uh, wow, radical transformation. Then you really got it. This... <laughs> oh, <ooh. laughs> I remember sit, like sitting up in my kitchen in the middle of the night with my you know newborn you know hanging off my chest. And, you know, emails from John Martin and watching weird raw videos and being up all night and nocturnal. And it was a very funny time for sure. Yeah. No, that's that's how uh, you just went right into the middle of it. Then. <laughs> and you, John? It's how did you... almost six years for me. An astrologer friend invited me to look at human design, kind of threw it in my lap. And my first reaction was like, oh no, not another system. What is this? Like, I, I don't know if I need this right now. And, but then uh, just finding out what it, just right off the bat, reading about what it meant to be a projector and mm-hmm. learning about that, it just started making so much sense. And 
was this kind of missing puzzle piece in my life that I hadn't been able to quite find a point of reference for or to understand why a lot of my experiences were so different than the people in my family or that I, had mm. my friends and you know what I'd kind of grown up with. And so it immediately just kicked off a, a pretty intense deconditioning process. Yeah, it's just changed everything, really. It's like changed everything, I would say, kind of more internally and on the inside. The outer world more or less has maintained the same. But, you know, the way I'm going about things and my relationships have really changed a lot through that process. Going back to the verbal gunslinger question and the having a connection to the throat, I have an open head, open ajna, open throat. And so I don't really relate to the verbal gunslinger so much. I I don't. Of course not. Yeah. I feel like I'm a completely different animal. (laughs) It's like I'm a projector. Yeah. That's the thing. Like all these variations of projectors, what we share is this penetrating aura, what we share is our strategy and the open sacral, of course, being non-energy beings, but sometimes it or almost ends there. <laughs> and you have, uh, especially people who have, uh, what, what's your channels? It's 2551. Yeah. yeah, of course, it's the only channel. Yeah, not two. Yeah, this, so this is not uh, going up to the throat. Mm-mm. My sister had that, and I know that so very well, how this uh, power of the ego well it's power yet it's a really a pumping heart goes into the g but that's where it doesn't really necessarily express it in the same way like me with my 81 and 31 (laughs) 7 really having to come out at the throat Mm -hmm. but it's it's more like a power this determination that you probably feel that's how you take your decisions when they're backed up by the ego i guess Mm -hmm. Um, yeah that's how you must be so you, you never have did you ever have this uh, urge to still tell people what's good for them not like a verbal gunslinger where you can't help it but because project the see you see everything how would this be expressed by by somebody who doesn't have those channels to the throat well mm-hmm. i absolutely did when especially when i was younger i would see a lot be watching mm-hmm. a lot and then without invitation or recognition, just start telling people (laughs) what they should and shouldn't Mm -hmm. be doing or (laughs) having an opinion about it. I have gate 17 up in my open Ajna and it was never received well. It it was very seldom received the way I wanted it to be. And I think it was a big part of my deconditioning, understanding these invitation dynamics and what it meant to be a projector to address that or to to look at that and bring more awareness to that process. What that's looked like for me now is really just not saying much or not talking and just waiting and waiting and waiting. And then if someone will specifically engage me and ask me a question, then everything will come online and then Mm. we can have a really nice exchange or we can plug in. But without that recognition and that specific engagement, it's almost like I, I don't even know what I'm doing there. I don't know if I have a role. I don't know if I have anything to say. You know, there's not a lot of consistency in terms of like my thinking or what's going through my head. And so it's really just a lot of, yeah, watching, waiting, awareness, but not quite knowing what to do until something's actually happening. Yeah. So it's this thing to need to speak and tell people, I think it's this general projector thing, especially before knowing our strategy and the invitation thing. But the gunslinger part then is (laughs) really the connection to the throat, which is still hard for me to hold back, I have to say, in certain situations, because it just comes as an impulse. But I really also had to learn to really watch out is it the right environment or not so it sounds like for me to me like it's easier for you john because you do not have these one of these channels yeah and for you uh, amy it's also a bit more like it's there the connection is there so it could just come out anytime so you have to watch it probably or has it become more automatically also for you to really wait for the invitation or is it something you need to remind yourself yeah I wait a lot, but also coming into this work actually, and to be interacting with people through readings and through counseling, it gives me a role and a place and a natural protocol to be able to communicate 
that Mm -hmm. is really fulfilling for me and is generally wanted by somebody who's going to pay me for that. So that sets up a dynamic where I have, I think because I have an outlet now and I have a, Mm -hmm. a format for being able to share what I see and what I know, there's not as much pressure to do that in my regular life, in my, in my day-to-day life outside of that dynamic, it's easier for Mm -hmm. me to just sit back. And in most cases, unless it's really affecting me to be able to just enjoy my own awareness with myself, which I could never do before Mm -hmm. I had gone through Mm -hmm. a lot of deconditioning. I don't think I actually really enjoyed everything that I was aware of just on my own, but now it's, that Mm -hmm. part is a little easier. And I can enjoy my own mind even when it's crazy, <laughs> even when it's a little bit crazy. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good. Well, that was a very important thing also, like you said, now it has this, uh, how do you call it, not structure, which is inner reading that people pay you for it. And that's the mm-hmm. outlet. That's also what I experience. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had this, this lucky thing in Ibiza where everybody wanted to know about human design. I was just speaking it all day long. But then I came back to Austria 10 years ago and it was not automatically the same situation anymore Mm. and there were people individuals who asked me what did you do in Ibiza so I could start again and uh, tell Mm. them and they were interested for a while then it was not something that would happen that often I went back to being a school teacher so the outlet just I'm realizing that now as you said that was not given so much so there were few years where I was um, again I had my online readings some friends and people they knew uh, wanted something and I I could uh, express it Mm -hmm. but just um, the time have shifted again when I quit my teacher job and I went to South Africa a few years ago for some months and I met people there again Mm -hmm. and uh, now in Austria it's also started but more online than um, in person And this was a shift apparently had to happen. I don't know why it's the pandemic in the end, but it happened before. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Then you're confined to places more and like people come from Facebook and other, they're mostly Facebook actually. Yeah. And I can express it again, it's needed again. And my motivation need can give what's needed by others. And so it's this pleasant feeling. Yeah, that was a very good thing. I'm like, why is it sometimes like that? And sometimes not so much. But when I was involved more as a school teacher again for a few years, when I also thought, yeah, I can't quit yet, and I reduce my hours I work there, but I will still go to a school. This was um, I restricted myself because there it was not really wanted. I looked up all the charts, of course, of the pupils and my colleagues, and <laughs> I lived that without forcing it on them and tried to manage. Mm-hmm. but I, I didn't have the outlet and now it's again of course I write a lot on Facebook well only when I feel there's an, a question and the an answer and it flows out of me and that's nice mm. but uh, readings are, of course are really really the perfect thing I guess. yes well I was curious about that because from your story it sounds like your initial interaction with human design was so personal and in and in person where you were actually interacting mm-hmm. with people regularly and sitting with people who were exploring and you're having conversations. And now obviously the whole world has moved more into this digital distance format. And even more so now, it seems like you're pretty active in that format as well. Do you find that easier in some ways? Do you enjoy that in some ways? Do, do, do you miss the in-person or is it just different? I will always miss Ibiza that's like I don't know a world that doesn't exist in that sense anymore of course that Ra died and he was there still so this was six seven years before he died that I was there when he was there and he inspired people although he always said he course as a five one same for me and for all five ones uh, we more we can reach strangers better than our own people close to us and his original community in the north of Ibiza San Juan where the old hippies and sannyasins where they didn't really take him that seriously but it was still kind of a spirit and even though he was not 
like they were like, yeah, yeah, and he's a bit crazy and this and that. But they still, they had, they knew, each of them knew which type they were. They had heard of, they were just listening. And uh, then there were areas in Ibiza where other people had just come more recently than the old hippies. And they took it all in and they really wanted to know because they were the strangers that were more interested and know the old stories. The former mates of, of Ra were just sometimes like, yeah, yeah, he had all kind of this and that. But in each community, no matter if it was the old hippies or the other people who came uh, later or just freaks all over the island and the tourists in summer, they all had this thing, Ibiza is somehow connected with human design and they want a reading or they want to have an update or they want their child know something about their child. So this was something that I don't think really ex has existed anywhere in that density over years. That's why, okay, it had to end probably <laughs> at one point. It was too good to be true. That was a starting point and it spread all over the globe now. And now it's all digital and online and we connected and it's all good and fine. But I will carry this with me alongside with other people that this was a point where it was normal and natural and we knew that the whole world will not be like that one day this is four percent of the poor four percent and uh, so there's always a limit a limitation and a limit to the people who can have access and can live it in under any circumstances yeah but it still it's spreading somehow at least around the globe even when i came to south africa there was somebody already waiting for me and say we build something up here well I couldn't come back now this year because I wanted to come back and then there was the pandemic, so it didn't happen. South Africa is also, well, not in a good place now and lockdowns and stuff, mm. so you can't travel. Mm. That's what it is, so we are only online, <laughs> you can only do stuff online. And um, fortunately, I'm adaptable, I'm, is it adaptable, mm -hmm. apparently? So, new world, and I can deal with it. It's also Probably because I'm a cave person, I can sit in my cave and write on my computer or contact people <laughs> being contact. I think the marketplace people is, is quite, pretty tough for them right now under these circumstances. Yeah. I had just an exchange with someone today and just like, yeah, marketplace and oh, it's not so easy. Mm -hmm. Like I can just sit in my cave. It's okay. I'm active in my cave, so I can just do stuff there. Yes, it's so good to always know the variables, especially for projectors. That's something that helps us so much to be correct and to check as a signpost. And I'm really lucky that I could study that for two years with Ra when I was in Abita. And I really hope everybody can yeah, get to know about it. But there we are again. Everybody is not possible. <laughs> it's only the people on our fractal. <laughs> I mean, we've been talking a lot about the G Center today. There was another aspect of it that I was hoping to explore with you is the Penta. You've got two Penta channels and a lot of activations in, in your G. And I'm wondering what your experience is as a projector in group dynamics. Have you been in Pentas besides your birth Penta? I mean, in terms of like your living situation? What is that like for you? Do you find that you end up taking on these roles that are defined in your in your channel definition? Or it's a good question, also <laughs> all good questions, anyways. <laughs> but yeah, the Penta. I did this one thing with a lock in Ibiza many years ago about family Pentas. So I got into Pentas, and then I looked into business Penta, but I never did an education there but I've got access to, to a lot of stuff. So, and also what I've learned in the theory and what I can experience myself or could is that I provide or people who have the channel provide the channels to the Penta. So the Penta has it then, but um, especially as a projector, you drown in it. You cannot be who you are. You cannot be recognized. And I couldn't as a child, of course, and I had two manifesting generator parents so my role was to, of course, bring the public relation of my 1-8 to the family. But as a fifth line being, it failed badly. So I had a bad reputation as a child. And I was a rebellious teenager. And it was 
terrible and horrible. And they hated me for that, but especially my mother who wanted it all in a certain way. And then with my bad reputation or whatever it was, I couldn't hide with my channels. And it was always the whole family thing then who had this reputation through me. So it was not so great. And the, my, my leadership channel, I like, am not invited. I cannot personally guide or lead into that future, which is this logical 31-7 alpha. Um, they could use it as a family thing, but I personally can't. And it caused friction and it was painful. Enter is different, of course, in certain workshops that I do sometimes in groups. If it's small enough, group work my present family situation is only me and my husband now my son moved out so that's not really a penta situation i can see that people are interested in me as i'm interesting for a penta which is this not self body of course <laughs> it's, um and we cannot have yet um conscious pentas aware pentas that's not for us human beings so i haven't had a lot of positive experience in permanent pentas. I have my people in my life that are not there at the same time necessarily, who would form a good penta maybe if we are all together, which doesn't happen that often. But as a person, I, I'm, I'd rather, and I know this is better for projectors, that to be at the edge and guide the penta if you can be the alpha. If they see you as that one alpha, it doesn't have to be a projector even who can guide, or not an alpha project. But yeah, with Penta, um, I usually struggle a bit. I'm a team player. I can see that um, when I'm in groups that happen and teams that I'm appreciated. But I haven't been actually in a long-lasting Penta. I could not say that, yeah. So my Penta experience is I, I don't like to be too much in a steady group all the time also. I can't be who I am. I just I wanted to see if it's the same for you or similar or if it's very different for you, Mr. Penta. It's very similar to what you describe. I feel like I can do Pentas for a limited mm. time. I can kind of be a team player in that I can try to harmonize with the group and not be too disruptive, but it doesn't really work. I don't feel like I can really be who I am in that group mm. unless there is a strong recognition and invitation into a particular role there. If they're asking for my awareness and guidance, and if it's, if it's genuine, then something can happen there. But in my experience with Pintas, I've always been, as you said, kind of run over or chewed up in the process. And I feel like the 2551 as a channel is pretty anti-Penta in itself. It's cutting right across the, mm. the G and it's, it's usually seen as a threat of some sort to the Penta. Like I'm just not playing by mm -hmm. their rules or I'm not, I'm not part of it. And I feel that pretty strongly is like, you know, again, not quite knowing what my role is there. If there's even a point to it, <laughs> that's a funny thing to continually experience, you yeah. know, decade after decade on the planet mm -hmm. and still feel like the individual operator who does better with one-on-one -on -one relationships. So mm -hmm. I can relate to what you're saying. Even the, of course, I'm a penta person with my channels and um, I can enjoy that also that I contribute with my channels, but the same thing still happens that I cannot be truly myself, which is a different thing on a correct one-to-one -one basis. Mm -hmm. So it's enjoyable in and out, but on a long-term basis, I wouldn't want to be in a penta. Uh, it's functional, it's competing, it's competitive. All the pentas compete with each other. So, of course, it's good to have me in a penta with my two channels. I can show the neighbors if it's not a this line thing who cannot, as a person, bring the practical solution, which is sometimes hard in a penta. You're absorbed. And then, as an individual, as a fifth line, it's like, hmm, this is not practical. So, what are you doing in this penta? <laughs> just thinking about it but also probably because as a child I had such a tough experience in my family and I didn't feel I was seen really in the penta mm -hmm. although I contributed they wouldn't have had those channels without me <laughs> but I still didn't want to let me go or actually yeah stay stay but be different mm, no <laughs>
Isn't, isn't that fascinating? It's such a, an experience that I think many people probably have in relationship. There's something about it to me, I don't know, as a projector to feel wanted or needed or held on to, and yet not recognized, not invited mm-hmm. and not, not seen. Mm-hmm. And yet there's a, there can be such a strong grip, whether it's mm-hmm. for the attention just the the raw attention that we bring or these mechanics that we can bring. I suppose it happens for, for everyone on, on some level, it can. But what a strange dynamic that we go through as human beings <laughs> in, in these situations <laughs> where we grip onto each other and yet we don't really want each other for what we are. It's, it's a very strange thing that we do and that yes. seems to get repeated in many, many families. Yeah, they don't know any better. Just the usually, well, in those days when my parents and I were in a penta, and my little sister, who is this other, well, was the other projector with only John's channel, uh, 5125, we could not really be who we were, and parents didn't know any better. They just said, apparently, I mean, of course, I've tried to figure it out what happened because they've long passed away. My dad died well, relatively young and I have a heart attack and my mom died of cancer also already almost 20 years ago. Could never have a relationship with them after having met human design. They can only try to make sense, which is my thing, <laughs> afterwards. And it's apparent they had no clue. They just must have felt as these two manifesting generators, uh, a lot of definitions that these delicate, projector things who we were as their daughters maybe would fail on that planet and they felt something they always tried to push us in that direction and that, the other and we should try harder should do more and that's not good enough so it's this permanent criticism also and it must have been some in- instinctive thing well they are not fit for this planet they are not fit in their terms, according to what they thought, um, how people should survive, all about this survival thing. And now, as I have learned about mind-centeredness and have been in the experiment for so long, I would be really curious what the interaction would be like. But it doesn't mean that it would be any better. (laughs) You can often be drawn back, I guess, as a fall back into your former roles I don't know if your parents are still alive and if you if it could bring a change to the whole family dynamics because you are in your experiments, I guess there must be some some change if you cannot be pushed back into your old conditioned self. Yeah, that's actually a nice way of putting it. When I go back home, both of my parents are still alive. And when we're back into a penta situation, you'll see a lot of the same dynamics and energetics, like that doesn't really change in, in terms of the who each person is and how we relate. I feel like maybe because of just, I don't know, maybe because of there, there is change or there is growth or another process in play that there is the potential for more awareness. And I can see that my parents, mm-hmm. through me talking to them and through the experiences that we've had and going back and forth and, and some of the friction that's come up that they're trying to look at things differently and they're trying to understand, but there's still this kind of fundamental difference between, you know, I'm the only projector in my family. My brother is a generator. Both of my parents are generators in my birth family. You know, I don't know that they'll ever really understand. Wow. (laughs) I really (laughs) won. That must be something. (laughs) Yeah. So some things change and then some things never change is what I'm finding. I was thinking about your situation that you were describing as a five one in that with two manifesting generator parents with expectations. And this is, you know, this is how it works in the world. This is what you do. And if you're not doing that, then something's wrong. It's Mm -hmm. not okay to be different than this. It's like, that must've really been something that. A lot of lines. Yeah. I have fifth lines in both my moon nodes and in other planets. So I'm just, a fifth line being <laughs> I for whatever reason I was always rebellious I could not help it the environment yeah was uh, would be like a 10 5 10 uh, 5 is my 
design uh, moon nodes, uh, the south node. So there was always an environment, apparently also correct for me, who would be fit and misfits. Uh, this 10-5 as an environment as a kid. But if it's not based on recognition, they were not like, oh, yeah, it's okay. They can be allowed to be a heretic, which would have been my correct environment. And it was not really, not the kind of heretic that I was. So that was not so lucky with my, despite my 46, 5 <laughs> sun gate, there were some forces just trying to put me in a different mold for, even if it was heretically, my parents were not politically conform with the others necessarily. So it was a kind of a heretic environment. By the way, I was, was not seen as yeah, appropriate either. And yeah, that was really tough. Uh, and I was even beaten up, I have to say, because I could not help it. I did what I did or was who I was. Just stuck to myself also. It could not change me. There was a lot of pain and, and sadness. Also as a teenager, I was very sad. I, was, I had a phase where I was crying every day. I remember that. Only then later it became a bit easier. I had a lot of good chances by serendipity, but also a lot of not being exactly recognized for who I am. Yeah, so this 5-1 life is not always easy, I guess. Yeah. I can relate to it in that I think especially if you, the parents or the people around you can sense that there's a certain kind of intelligence in you and a capacity in you, and then there's the fifth line expectation. It's sort of like, well, you could do it. You could. I, we can see that you're smart enough. You're capable. You could fulfill this potential. So why aren't you? Why won't you? And I, <laughs> exactly. I think about it for myself because I think when I was younger, I having more openness than you do, I would just imitate. I, I could imitate everything. And that's just what I would do. I didn't have anything to anchor me. Yeah. I didn't have that anchor, mm -hmm. but I, I can hear it. Yeah. And that in the way you're talking about it, I can almost feel that strongly defined anchor in you. And I could see why as a child, like mm -hmm. that story you told, you, you wouldn't be able to beat that out of you or no. strip that out of you. It's, it would mm -hmm. persist. It, you wouldn't be able to make it go away. So it would have had to kill me, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember somebody, somebody saying a story about that too. It was a manifester. It might've been a log. Somebody told us, told a story about having that kind of mm -hmm. uh, clarity inside themselves and, and being hit by a parent and then having the parent realize, mm -hmm. wow, this isn't going to work. I'd have to kill this kid. Like <laughs> there's no level of escalation <laughs> yes. to this violence that would control this child. And what a, yeah. a trip to see that. This is the design, yeah. How can you change it? You cannot and you shouldn't. Of course, it would be so sad if this was possible. Mm -hmm. You can break people, of course. Yeah. I don't know what it would have taken. So they, at least it was not that extreme that I don't think I was ever close to being broken. Mm -hmm. And it's also a more a fourth line thing, the rigidness of the four ones, for instance. You could break them if you put enough pressure on them. Mm -hmm. Like with the G, I would still feel some love in me because that was who I was. It was my identity. And of course, it hurts if this is criticized. But to break it, I don't know what it would take. Um, a lot, I guess. And so I always felt there's still something and I can't help it. But I was also very much ashamed and full of guilt because I heard so often, no, that's wrong, and they shouldn't do it like that whatsoever. And there was a lot of shame and guilt being built up. And there was also a Catholic environment on top of everything <laughs> in school, and I didn't do it right for them either. And yeah, everybody had something to say why I was not the perfect little girl or teenage girl that they expected me to be. I was so far from it. I mean, I didn't do things. It was just the look in my eyes. I, I remember teachers freaking out. I was sitting in the last row in a class and he was talking something in the front. And as you said, if you're intelligent and you know it, and I was also bored then. And then I just rolled my eyes at something he said. 
I was quiet, I was silent, but he focused on me, of course, yeah, although there were many pupils still in classes in like 30 years ago, even longer, 40 years ago. And he would just start screaming from zero to, I don't know, 100. You go out, you leave this class, you can't be here. You just, I would push you through that closed door if I didn't feel the consequences <laughs> even set. It was just a look in my eyes. It was so provocative. I don't know. I couldn't see it myself. And then he shouted himself into a rage. And then he was like, and I was about to pack my things and leave the classroom. I'm like, okay, he doesn't want me here because I roll my eyes. And he even said that he could read from my lips that I had formed the word idiot with my lips. And I didn't. I don't know what I did, but he projected that on me. Oh. <laughs> and uh, before I could even leave or could even get up from my desk, he was like, no, 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 you stay, you stay because you... In, in German, you say washed with all waters. Yeah, you will just. He, he was afraid of me that it could be his detriment if I had to leave the classroom. I would do something to him. <laughs> he really saw the devil in me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, then I'll stay here. And he didn't know to, he wanted to kick me out, but he said he couldn't. And it got really intense. Well, this happened to me. <laughs> Quite a, a fifth line experience but oh. this hasn't happened to me for a long time now at least i have to say to be okay. like the devil like the <laughs> demon like i don't know <laughs> the antichrist times have changed and human design has really helped me to find different environments to find different people and not be so like i don't know what it was mm. just not in the right place at the right time i guess <laughs> Yeah, there was this no choice thing as a kid. And it was also because they wanted me to go to some gymnasium that's called in German in, in Austria, where it's the higher school, but I always wanted to go to the lowest of easiest of all schools possible. Because I was like, no, I'm not doing anything anymore. It just pissed me off everybody. <laughs> so I ended up in schools where they were not the best schools, actually, because they refused to do anything. And uh, that's probably also worse than not so helpful to being treated with respect. It took me a while that I, mean, I still did my A-levels in the end and studied and finished my studies. So it was not a thing that hindered me because somehow it always happened. But I ended up in environments. Wow. Mm. And I think back of it, being screened there, it was just very short of being hit even in school. But then I left and one day and I got drunk and I came back drunk into class again. So it was not just them, it was me as well, misbehaving as much as I could. And then you well, became a teacher. And I became a teacher, yeah. I was a school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but I have gate 15 also as a gate of extreme. I have it twice. It's the other moon node on the design side. That's 15.5. Mm. Uh, oh, it's always about extremes. But now I've quit school. And I'm a, an adult education and I train trainers and I do all the soft skills that I like, communication, I don't have to mark, I can do group dynamics and mm. just have to be cautious not to overstrain myself. Mm -hmm. If I'm like too carried away and if I accept some jobs that are a bit out of my league still, or I think they are out of my league, everybody's like, you can do it, you can do it. So if the inv invitation is there, it's okay. But then, oh no, they are projecting on me. Can I really do it? Yeah, but so far, so good. So there's a lot of talk in terms of G projectors in terms of authority mm. that describes the process of using that authority as using the voice. Do you use that a lot? And for some reason, I get the sense from you from, from listening to you that, that if there were an invitation or something offered to you, I get the sense that there would there would probably be some kind of uh, G center resonance or or recognition or or mm -hmm. light up that would happen that would maybe not even require your voice. But mm -hmm. I'm curious about how you actually do you use the authority in an active way or in a way that's connected to the voice as well. Another good question. I mean, as a teacher, I was also a language teacher and. 
Spain. I learned Spanish within a year and then I was in the school. Well, my son was in kindergarten and there were other, it was an international school, actually a school where I was teaching before. They heard me speak uh, Spanish and the other parents who were German, English, and they struggled. They couldn't learn Spanish. It was, I don't know, for adults. And they were, oh, I can't learn that. So you speak Spanish. You're a teacher. We know that from your biography. And you are our Spanish teacher now. So that was the invitation recognition. So, of course, I needed my voice to speak and, and help them. But I can see that I'm good at what I'm doing is if I let them work, if I get them into working, only guiding more and more, and they have dialogues, I guide them towards dialogues, or now in my adult education, I group them and I give them a task. And the more I can withdraw and get them into working, the better it is. If I still stand there, and sometimes it's okay to give input and to tell them something or talk about something, when I do not get exhausted and when I get more recognition, I do less talking. I guide them into doing and learning by doing by themselves. That's the ultimate thing. And I'm not always there, but getting there. Yeah, good question. That's exactly the thing. It's true. And if I talk too much and I get carried away, then I can see I lose the, the thread. Mm -hmm. I have to say, okay, stop yourself. <laughs> One of my two bridging gates would be the 43, which is structure. And it's still the thing, do I have structure? And then I'm laughing because if you identify with your bridging gate, oh, you'll know where you can. It's like, oh, I don't have it. So I'm like recognizing people, I've got it, friends who can support me, another G projector who is a colleague of mine, and she only has the 43, not the 23. So we have an electromagnetic and I can profit from her structure. And I'm like, yeah. Michaela, it's about recognizing people who have it, bring them into your life if, or connect, not try to have it or say, oh, I can't, I don't have structure. Yeah. That's the yeah. focus on the thing that doesn't work. Mm -mm. No, very good questions. Yeah, you do a really amazing job, you guys. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, wow, I'm really impressed. This is fun for us. Um, I mean, all of it's been fun, but it's it's really special to be able to talk with you and another projector and someone who's been so deep into this for so long. You know, in terms of your work in human design, you're doing sessions with people, doing foundation readings, or could you tell us a little bit about what you offer and how people might contact you if they were interested in working with you? Yeah, well, as it works now, it's via Facebook. Some people say, oh, we saw your comments in the projector groups or uh, Cohen put something up. That was really great of Cohen also to ask people, I don't know if you've both seen it, to mm -hmm. post their details. And uh, it's given it another push also. And so usually it's through Facebook. They write me personal message, a private messages, although we haven't been connected as friends. But then sometimes I see it only days later because these messages are like, oops, somebody wanted something. <laughs> And I'm very flexible also with my prices because I know COVID, I know projectors. So I always find a way which is correct for everybody. And for some people, it's easy to pay like normal prices. But for some people, I know the struggle or the living countries where it's really tough. And I'm going to say, okay, how much is there? Is it a deal? So I still feel it's not nothing. But um, And as I love doing it so much, so I always usually find a way. Uh, to connect with people and give them at least something of what they can really need and, and work with. And it can be a foundation reading. It can also be because I, although I'm not a certified race psychologist because I studied three years with Ra and I wrote my thesis, I did all the exams and it were like really high hits and it was all good and I would have been a race psychologist, but I couldn't hand in my thesis. I took me a year to write about and charts and variable groups. And it was too much focused on myself, also a G projector, and it's not what a projector would do. But Ron never said anything. Just, yeah, carry on, carry on. Just write it. And then I was ready. I put it together. I sent it to him. And three days later, he died. So this happened to me. There was not the serendipity. And I was like really shocked anyways. And 
uh, was a big shock. I had already gone to Austria and still I had this love for the person also, although he could be very grumpy sometimes and we all know that he wasn't always the nicest person, but that was <gasps> the shock and I didn't really recover for a whole year, like trying anything or doing anything. And then I contacted some other people, but I didn't have the energy to fulfill the requirements they would have wanted from me to fulfill. Yeah, I don't want to say names. I mean, our lock was pretty fair and I would have had to do just a little thing, but I couldn't even do that. I was just too shocked. And somebody else was also in charge and she was like, you have to do this and this and do the exams again. And I was like, what? I scored like 97% with Ra. Why would I do that again? And so there was a no-go for me. Mm. Um, so, oh, and then I had this for all these years. I still need to be certified. And now things are not the way they used to be anymore. So I'm like, I give readings. Ra said yes. And he would have said, yeah, whatever thesis. He would have stopped me before and not let me write the whole year. But I didn't get the official stamp. Maybe he would have let me rewrite something, probably. I, I really don't know. He was just not saying a lot. Yeah, carry on, carry on. Never <laughs> <laughs> giving me any, any hint to if it was running in the wrong direction or not. Or, you know, like 50 pages and nothing <laughs> was just for... Yes. Yeah. So this was this weird story with our race ecology. Mm. And then I just started some PHS on my own. So I just give variable readings sessions yeah. you can't you actually you shouldn't call it readings that's what Ra was very strict about mm -hmm. it's more like a psychologist you give sessions you accompany people mm -hmm. as a reading is an analyst thing but not uh, as a psychology or now they call it holistic readings yeah. or whatever so i just do that Yes. <laughs> because I can. <laughs> because you can, yes. Well, it's, it's clear to us that you you have certainly a depth of knowledge. And I'm sure that for people who can resonate with that, they would get quite a lot out of working with you. Well, we have really enjoyed getting to talk to you. Thank you mm -hmm. for giving us your time and sharing your wisdom and your experience. Feels like a rare treat for people to get to hear from you. Uh, look forward to you being at the Rave Marathon. I hope people will get to experience you there also. Mm, yeah, I hope yeah. It's, it's more, uh, my, my idea is more like about projectors, our role in the future and coming up to 2027. What can we do in the future? Yes. With my logical channel of the 317, hopefully being part of the invitation. <laughs> Otherwise, I can't say anything about the future. Yeah. But I've really, really enjoyed talking to you. And I'm still like, wow, the question. You're seeing me I'm very deeply touched also. Hmm. My chi lights up. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> oh, good. No, thank you, guys. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. Yeah, I loved it. I'm looking forward to hearing your talk at, at the Rave Marathon. Oh, my God. It fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I haven't really got an agenda, which for my left mind will come up something. I need some plans. Otherwise, although I have hopefully a good foundation after 16 and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> but still, about the marathon, that needs to be an agenda. Yes. yes. Yeah. I was thinking about how funny it is that we were talking about how much as projectors we need to learn to shut up and then how funny it is to be put in this position where it's like, can you talk for an hour? It's like, yes, I can come up with something. We, we can come up with something to, with something to say, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, something will come up. In any case. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you, both of you. And I'm very happy to have connected with you. And thanks again. And it's really made my evening here, made my day, made my week, whatever. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks to everybody who will listen. And um, it's, it's good that, yeah, John and Amy doing that. Yeah, grateful, grateful, grateful for that chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Human Design Collective podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please review us and share. 
For more information about us and to connect with others on this experimental journey, please visit us at humandesigncollective.com. You can also learn more by exploring our course and workshop offerings at courses.humandesigncollective.com. Music for the Human Design Collective podcast, courtesy of Role Model. For more information, see the show notes. And please stay tuned for more upcoming episodes on the same channel.